All right, last week we introduced a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And today we're going to begin, and what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these at a time, of each of the nine, and spend a Sunday with it to explore it, to look at it from multiple angles, and to find out what it looks like to live out, to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, there's fruit that's produced in the life of a believer. When we say a believer, we mean a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ. These things, these fruit of the Spirit, reflect the character of Christ flowing through us and into the world. Now, when you belong to Jesus, here's what happens. As you lean into that relationship, these things are going to start showing up in ever-increasing, ever-expanding kinds of ways. The fruit of the Spirit we said last week, is an evidence that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. It's one of the things, there's certain things that are markers in the scriptures that say, this is how you know that you belong to Jesus. This is one of them. You know you belong to Jesus when the fruit of the Spirit comes to characterize your life. That the character of Christ comes to characterize your character. Now, it's more than having good intentions. It's more than willpower. It's more than, oh, I'm going to try to be a good moral person. Because you can't wish yourself to be more like Jesus and start somehow by an act of your will producing eternal fruit. This is a work God does, and we do it in concert with Him as we cooperate with God the Holy Spirit in the process. Here's what, here's what Galatians 5 says. Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, he says, there is no law. What's interesting about the fruit of the Spirit is that in what we're about to read in 1 Corinthians 13 with the love chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, several of these show up in Paul's definition of what love is. That love captures uh, the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. So we'll be seeing that in just a moment. Now here's what we need to remember. As a reminder from last week, the word in the Bible is singular. It's fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit, which seems odd when, you're, when you have a nine things. You think it would be plural, but it is singular, and here's why. Because in God's plan for our lives, you don't say, well, I like out of the nine, I like number three, I like number five. Those come pretty easy to me. I'm going to skip the rest. You can't, you can't pick and choose, delete or add the ones that are easy, the ones that are hard. But these are all to be reflected in our character as a believer in Christ. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, it's this composite description of what an all-around, growing, maturing, spiritual, eternal, spiritual, fruit-producing believer, this is what it ought to look like. And here's how it works. When you give your life to Christ, there's a process of becoming more like Jesus. It doesn't happen instantly. You know, you, you pray, you can be, you can, your eternal destiny changes in an instant. But your character, that's a process. And here's how Paul talks about the process of spiritual maturity, spiritual growth working. He says in Philippians 2, he says to the Philippians, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're not earning that salvation, but you're, you're growing salvation reflected through your life. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. So it's a cooperative effort. God's going to work in you, God the Holy Spirit working in you, and you're going to work with Him. There's some things you need to work on and work out as you become more like Jesus. So it, it's together. Now here, I heard a guy once say that this is great news. It's great news because as a believer in Jesus Christ, God is at work in you. But there's bad news on the other side of this. You're still in you too. And it's that part that we have to work out. We have to deal with. We're going to have to work on those remnants of our old self that are still in existence. Systematically address them, lay them aside. And so as we look at these nine things, we're going to have plenty of opportunity to work on that. So over the next few weeks, we're going to walk through the fruit of the Spirit, what these words mean, what it looks like when that fruit is evident in your life. And each week, we're going to find a challenge. Here's the challenge. Here's my life. And here's... Today it's love. Next week, 
love, next week joy. We're going to say, here's my life, here's this fruit, and how does my life reflect that? Do other people see me in that? And we'll, we'll drill it down to the people who know me best. Would they say, yeah, I see that in you. So, fruit of the Spirit. Here we go. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, there are a lot of things about love. That passage in 1 John I read earlier is a great passage about love, defining it. But this is, this is a good spot to go, and we need a good definition for love. So here we go. This is 13 verses, 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, Paul's talking to the Corinthians. He said, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Well, those are a couple of the uh, fruit of the Spirit. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. But we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now, in, in most English translations, when you read through 1 Corinthians 13, it appears that all these words are adjectives, uh, descriptive words. But that's not true at all. And it sounds that way in my translation. Love is patient. Love is kind. But actually, all those words in that descriptive part of this chapter are verb forms. And here's why. Because love is an action. It's not a feeling. Not in God's word. These are all verbs. This is the spectrum of love. Understood in how it acts, not in how it feels. Do you get the difference there? That's the worst way to define love as a feeling. I remember uh, a lot of romantic... In fact, yesterday, this is what got me started on songs, is uh, yesterday I was coming home from mom and dad's. They live in Hot Springs, Arkansas. I left early in the morning, and there's, a, there's not a lot of choices in your listening pleasure in some of those spaces uh, along that path. And, but I found a station in the... And the way they introduced themselves at each break was classic country. Well, I, sadly, I know a lot of classic country uh, for, in, for, for several different reasons. I know a lot of classic country. And a lot of them, uh, given definitions for love, you know, love, kind of love is a feeling you get when you feel like you're about to have a feeling you've never felt before. A fairly shallow view of, of love. And we defined a lot of human love that way, <clears throat> but that's not how biblical love is defined. We as believers, with the Holy Spirit of God residing in us, demonstrate something that's a whole lot bigger than that. When you think about love and defining it, I like 1 Corinthians 13 a lot. I'm still debating, but I think I'm going to go for it. Okay, so how many of you, how many of you on your uh, iTunes, your uh, playlist, your electronic device. How many of you have any Tom T. Hall songs? Nobody? Nope. Nobody has a where? where oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you for being a a lover of finer things. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that about you. Um, 
Yeah, Tom T. Hall. And the reason I do is because I took guitar lessons in late elementary school through middle school. I had this, I had this country guy uh, who, who gave me guitar lessons uh, for all those years. And he had, a, he had a really, he was a pretty big boy, but he wore, he wore his jeans, a really tight shirt. He had his sleeves rolled up to about right here on that tight white shirt, except there were cigarettes rolled up in this side. He smoked during our whole lesson. I wonder now why my mother really let me ever go have lessons with this guy. But we, he, it was going to be all country songs, so we sang a lot of country songs. And one of the country songs that we sang and I learned during that time was uh, a Tom T. Hall song. Now, one of the things you have to know about Tom T. Hall, he wrote songs. He was a horrible vocalist. He really couldn't sing at all. So doing a cover song for Tom T. Hall is not that hard. Um, but he had this one song. And the name of the song is I Love. And then he starts, he starts talking about it. And it's a love song, but he says, this is Tom T. Hall. <clears throat> this, this is available uh, for sale on iTunes, my cover of Tom T. Hall's I Love. Uh, so he, he'd say, I love. And it's about how it came off. I love little baby ducks, old pickup trucks slow moving trains and rain okay that was the first verse it was awesome yeah thank you oh there's more don't don't stop me here i'm on a yeah i love coffee in a cup little fuzzy pups tomatoes on a vine and onions and then this is the tagline in the song and I love you too. Uh, I don't know who his beloved was, but I got a feeling it didn't work out because onions and you. Man, yeah, it's just all. And that's how, uh, for a lot, of lo a lot of people, that's how they think about love. We don't have a, we need, a, we need more words for love in the English language, obviously. A lot of languages do have more words for love. The Greek language does is, one, one word that's more of a affinity, patriotic kind of word for love, storge. And it's, it's the one where, you know, you say, you know, I love uh, America. I love ice cream. There's another word for romantic love, uh, more of the feeling kind of love, more of the country and western song kind of love, uh, eros. There's another word that meant the brotherly kind of love, uh, phileo, uh, like... Uh, you know, that's the kind of love, uh, you know, men have for one another, that manly, moose-killing kind of love, phileo. Well, then there's agape, which is this selfless, unconditional, sacrificial kind of love. And when the Bible talks about love in 1 Corinthians 13 or in 1 John 4, that's the word that's showing up. That's the word that shows up in John 3, 16. And that word is the word that really, really defines love. So that's where we'll spend our time. This unconditional, unselfish love. We see a lot of conditional love. Love based on desire. Love based on expectation. Love that says, uh, if then. You know, the if then kind of love. If, if you're good, if you please me, if you return my love, if you're beautiful and you remain so, I will love you. There's an if and a then. It's a very conditional. It's temporary. There's no long-term commitment to it. It comes and goes at, at, a, at will and at whim. But with conditional love, we find decision follows emotion. If you feel it, then you, then you do something. But agape kind of love, the kind of love the Bible talks about here it's different than that because there's a decision and the feeling develops from the decision. In the songs I listened to yesterday on the radio, I have three more I'd like to sing. No, I really don't. Uh, but in the songs on the radio about love, and this is true for most, most, uh, most popular music at whatever genre, it, it's always, well, I feel something, therefore I act. But in... in but then, if there's not a feeling, and there, there was some of that uh, in those songs yesterday where, well, she just doesn't love me anymore. She said she doesn't feel it, and so she left me. You know, that was one of the songs from yesterday. And there's a lot of that. I don't feel it. I don't feel love for you. Therefore, there must not be love. 
Love is a commitment. Love is a decision that you make in the Bible. It's not something that comes and goes with your feelings. Feelings are fickle. The heart is deceptive above all things, the Bible says. And what you, you, you act in love, and then the feeling comes. And that's the nature of love in the Bible. I will love, and therefore, there is feeling that comes with it, but it comes after the commitment. The truth is, agape love is even more hearty, more stubborn than just working on it hard. Because this is the love in the Bible. This is the love that's so hard to understand in the midst of crisis in the world. It wills love even in the face of fierce resistance. It chooses to love not just before there's emotion, but sometimes in spite of other emotions. In the face of betrayal, in the face of rejection, in the face of hatred, evasion, just rank badness. It wills love even when the circumstances trigger instincts of anger and hurt, withdrawal, revenge. Agape can take and build a house on the ruins of brokenness and make it beautiful. Here's another way to say it. Agape is not a because of kind of love. It's an in spite of kind of love. That's what this looks like in our relationships. It's a love of the great, <laughs> the great nevertheless. It exists free of conditions, fueled by something within itself rather than circumstances or stimuli outside itself. There's even a, a more simple way, I think, to say this, a more precise way to understand agape kind of love. It is unprovoked love. Now, you hear, you hear unprovoked violence. In an act of unprovoked violence, a gang came upon a guy at a bus stop and beat him up and stole from him unprovoked. Think about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is an example of un, there's an act of unprovoked violence. This man is robbed, beaten, and left for dead by the side of the road. Two religious guys pass by because they have other things more important. They don't really want to engage. I'm just looking out for a good old number one. But then the Samaritan stops. And in an act of unprovoked love, sacrificial love, he stops at a great expense to himself, sacrificing his comfort and his calendar. He reaches out to this broken down man he carries him to a place of safety. He provides shelter. He provides care. He provides food and all that. See, this kind of love, it doesn't depend on worthiness or popularity or good manners. It doesn't back off because of clumsiness or attract, unattractiveness or rudeness or, or just how complicated love is going to be. When it finds us, at personal cost and risk with no promise of reward, it heals our wounds, all unprovoked. Always, always, as we'll look at the fruit of the Spirit, we find these things first foremost modeled, demonstrated in the character of God. The Bible gives us the most beautiful example of unprovoked love as it flows in the heart of God. God shows His love for us in that. While we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. Totally undeserved, unprovoked. He loves us because God is love. It is central to his character. And he calls us to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, love. Now, the Apostle Paul, he takes this wonderful topic of love and in 1 Corinthians 13, it's like a beautiful diamond. He just holds it up to the light. And he looks at it from every, every angle, and he starts describing it. So that's what you get in this passage. And, and I'm not going to go through every one of these words, but I want to give you a good taste and definition of love from this passage. But I'd like to, I'd like to do it through the back door of the story. In my thesaurus on my computer, I use it often to find different words, different ways, or different way to say something. And, and it always gives you not just synonyms, but antonyms. What's the opposite of this word? And in my thesaurus on my computer, it says the opposite of love is hate. And that's not really true. 
the opposite of biblical love is self-centered love. It is self-love, selfishness. Jesus, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And we go, well, shouldn't you love yourself? You should see yourself as God sees you, not as the world describes you, not as Satan in planting seeds into your life tries to tear you down. You should see yourself as a valuable person created in his image. But you're not supposed to be in love with yourself, enamored with yourself, so self-centered that you can't reach out beyond yourself to other people. Some people are so in love with themselves, it seems like they just get up in the morning and they look in the mirror and sing how great they are to themselves, I guess. The opposite of agape kind of love is this self-centered kind of attention. And in this passage, what I'd like to do is just contrast what does self-love look like and what does agape love look, look like? What's the difference between these two things? How are they alike? How are they different in our relationships to people, in our relationships to our world, to our family, neighbors, friends? So, first, we'll talk about self-love. Self-love is impatient. And this is your outline part. You can note some of these things. Self-love is going to be impatient. And that means it has a short fuse. When you're not doing it the biblical way, there's a short fuse. It doesn't have the ability to wait on someone else. It can't stand to be inconvenienced. Agape love, though, is patient. Paul says love is patient, and it's a verb. It's not a feeling. You don't say, I feel patient today. It's not often I'm going to feel patient in my life, the way I'm wired. But God called me to act patiently. To act with patience, to make choices that demonstrate a biblical patience. It's a word that the literal meaning to be inconvenienced and yet to endure it. To not strike back when you are inconvenienced. There's an early church leader named Chrysostom. He, he was defining this word. He, he defined it with a sentence. The Love is patient part. He said, a man who is wronged and has it in his power to avenge himself, but will never do it. Uh, in our culture, we have this thing called a killer instinct going for the jugular, and we use it in a lot of different applications. I want my voice to be heard. I'm demanding my rights. What's mine is mine. Greek culture had some of that too. And this was a big cultural change and a, a swimming upstream against culture because the Christian faith just about always is. If you find yourself blending in with the crowd, you can be pretty sure you're going away from God because the crowd's not following God most all the time. So in our culture, patience means you, you restrain yourself, you hold back, you show meekness. Uh, another one of the Another one of those fruits of the Spirit. It's, it's a characteristic of God. God is love. God is patient. Peter wrote, talking about the character of God, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises. Some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Well, aren't you glad God's patient? Don't you expect God to be patient? Most of us do. Well, I know, I don't have it all together. I know I still keep doing the same dumb things I've been doing for a long time. I know I'm asking for forgiveness for the same thing I asked forgiveness for last week, last month, last year, 10 years ago. I'm still, but God, I want you to be patient with me. We, we expect God to be patient with us. And as we reflect his character, we're going to be patient with other people. Well, they don't deserve it. They keep doing the same dumb thing over and over again. They just keep poking me in, in the ribs with a sharp stick uh, over some behavior they have going but love is patient, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, but because it's the character of Christ made evident in you. Second thing is that self-love is mean. It says in verse 4, love is kind. And uh, the characteristic of self-love is it's just mean. Some people have very little love in their hearts. And uh, we see a lack of love in a lot of people's hearts, so self-centered, so in love with themselves and how they think that they, they don't care about anybody else. I, I read a story about a man. He, he went to see the doctors. Really, something was terribly wrong. They finally identified it. He said, well, he, 
any, any unusual circumstances recently? He said, I don't know. Something bit me the other night. I was out in the backyard. They looked, and well, sure enough, they tested him. He said, I got some bad news for you. You have rabies. I mean, it's treatable at this stage, but you have rabies. And the man didn't bat an eye. He just, he just took out a pen. He took out a piece of paper. He started writing. The doctor said, what are you writing? He said, well, before I get better, I'm writing the name, names down of people I hate so I can bite them. <laughs> well, there are people that just like that. The Bible says agape kind of love is not mean. It's kind. It's kind. What is kindness? Someone once said kindness is, is love putting its work clothes on. It's love when you put your work clothes on. That It's love when it goes to work. And here again, the word does not mean I feel kind. It means I am going to pursue acts of kindness toward other people. If you love them, you will demonstrate that love in tangible acts of kindness. You ever notice the... Uh, Sometimes people talk about random acts of kindness in our culture. And it seems like everyone I've ever talked to about random acts of kindness, they say, oh, yeah, I've done that before. Uh, I, was in the, I was in the line at uh, drive through at Starbucks, and I just, I'm going to pay for the guy behind me in line. Random act of kindness, just surprise him. Isn't that cool? I said, wow, that's awesome. You know, when was that? 2006. Because it's way too random when you're doing random acts of kindness. When the fruit of the Spirit is love is kind, it's going to be continual acts of kindness. It's an ongoing pattern of your life, not just a scatter shooting here, there, or yon. We demonstrate it. The Bible says love is kind. Paul says be, in Ephesians, be kind to one another, tender-hearted. That's a part of this because we're hard-hearted and selfish. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another because you're going to have to do a lot of forgiving if you're going to spend time with people and continue to be kind. And why? Because God and Christ forgave you. Now, where do you apply that? How about, how about at home? How about at home first? Are you showing kindness towards your members of your own family? Because I want to tell you who you are at home is who you really are. And you can put on a public demonstration of this is what I believe and this is what I think is true and you can say a lot of big, do a lot of big declarations and, and you can do great in your public spheres, but who you really are is who you are at home. And what do people see at home? What are those people who know you best? What do they see? Do they see kindness? Because if they don't see it at home, but they see you playing a game out there somewhere else, it's the highest level of hypocrisy. Kindness starts at home. Husbands and wives don't dare say, I love you, if you're not willing to show kindness to them. Self-love is mean. Agape love is kind. Self-love is envious of success. Verse 4 says, love is kind. It does not envy. That means self-love is envious of success, the success of other people. In contrast, agape love is glad for the success in the life of another person. Celebrates what's going on in other people's lives. Envy can take several forms. You can look at another person. You can be envious of, envious of how they look, envious of what they have, envious of what they've accomplished. And then there's a more insidious sort of, sort of envy and jealousy, and that's the one where you're just wishing they lost it all. When, when they have a setback, you kind of celebrate it. And that's a darker version of the self-love sin. It's a dangerous kind of envy and jealousy. There's so many examples of this. We find plenty of examples in the Bible. You have, you have uh, two brothers, Cain and Abel sons of Adam and Eve. And they both bring a sacrifice to God. And God accepts Abel's sacrifice, but he rejects Cain's sacrifice. There's some heart things going on with Cain that lead to that rejection. And, and so what Cain is so envious, so jealous of his brother, this has made him so angry, this brother has had this affirmation, he does not, that, that Cain kills his brother Abel. There's a story about a guy named Joseph. And Joseph, his dad's played, there's a lot of family dynamics going on in that story. His father's played favorites with him. His brothers have seen it. And they're jealous of their brother, what father does for him, how he's elevated him. Then Joseph says, hey, I had this great dream last night. Oh, yeah, well, tell us about it. 
Well, you were all bowing down to me in the dream. Okay, well, that makes us feel good about you, Joseph. And so this continues to boil in them, stir in them, until one day they, they take him, throw him into a pit, and they decide, what are we going to do with him? He's such an irritation to us. And they say, well, let's fake his death and sell him to slave traders. I don't know what sibling rivalry looks like in your family, but it probably hadn't gotten to that level yet. That's what jealousy and envy is it al is allowed to boil and boil and boil until finally it boils over. Self-love is envious, but, but agape love, biblical love, does not envy. Self-love brags. Self-love brags. I'm somebody big. The word means uh, literally talking big, boasting out loud. Uh, it's... Uh, it's promoting yourself, pushing yourself to the forefront, always bragging. Look what I've done. Look at what I have. Look at who I am. And on the other hand, uh, agape kind of love is, is selfless and quiet, does not boast. You ever known anybody like that? You ever known anybody? In fact, go ahead and, this is one of those times in the service, just for personal application. Go ahead and point to that person right now as your point of application. Somebody that it's always about them. You, you, you start in any conversation, and immediately they'll take off with a long story, a long, complicated, look, look at what I've done, look at what I've accomplished. Me, my mind, I fills the conversation. I read, I read there's a bird native to South America called a Mimi bird. I don't know any, uh, I don't think I, I've ever had a personal encounter with a Mimi bird myself, but I've known a lot of Texans that, Seem to be me, me, birds, me, 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 my. There's a guy named John the Baptist, John, uh, John chapter 3. He's, he's the hottest ticket in town. Everybody's going out to see John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. He, he's, he has drawn crowds. People are saying, maybe this is the Messiah. There are religious leaders from Jerusalem that are hard hearts that are going out and saying, I want to be baptized because I want to turn away from my sin because I've seen some things in you that are pretty incredible. I want to follow you, John the baptizer. There are Roman soldiers who are saying, what do I need to do, John? I want to follow you. You're such a great guy. You're incredible. People are saying, you've got, you got a real following here. And John says, man, I'm not the guy. This isn't about me. I'm, I am just a guy. There's a guy coming. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Uh, I, I'm baptizing you know, symbolically with water or baptism of repentance. There's a guy coming. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then they poke him again a little later, and they say, John, a lot of your followers are leaving you to follow this Jesus guy. And John says, he must increase, I must decrease. Love says, when it's selfless instead of selfish, I'm going to think about me less. I'm not going to think less of me, but I'll think about me less, and I'll think about others more. I'm going to turn my focus outward. I'm going to seek to encourage and elevate and move others forward. That's what a disciple maker does. Here's what happens. A couple thousand years ago, there was this church, not unlike most churches today, and they were doing things. People were making commitments, and people were growing, and they had good things going. And crowds gathered, and, uh, and somewhere along the way, this church, they got some things twisted up about, <laughs> in Corinth, about relationships, and about how they got along, and about what was important and what was not. And one of those places was, and it's a, it's a core thing that they needed to address, was about how they saw love. How they saw, what, what is love? And I want you to listen to this. It just gives you a different feel. This is from the message paraphrase. It's more of a commentary than a translation. And uh, what happens in the message is they'll take a word and sometimes define it with a sentence. But I want to read a portion of 1 Corinthians 13 from the message as a way to think about what is this thing called love? He says, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't have love, I'm nothing but a creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all its mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor, 
even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't have love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up, cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. So that's what love looks like. And here's me. Here's you. And do those things line up? And that's a matter of prayer and, and a matter of God. Sometimes we don't see ourselves clearly, so we need the Holy Spirit's help. So we say, as a believer, God, just peel back the layers of me where maybe I've been making excuses and justifying some things. and Let me see myself as I really am. Let me... Let me be what you really want me. Let me demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, which begins with, and really covers so much, love.